I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no religious body seeks to impose its will, directly or indirectly, upon the general populace. Let's restore respect for America's secular roots. Help the Freedom From Religion Foundation defend the wall of separation between state and church. Join us at FFRF.org. Freedom depends on freethinkers. Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. Annie Laurie and I are co presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces this program. FFRF, with 32,000 members, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists and agnostics, and works diligently as a state church watchdog to keep religion out of government. You can join us, you can become a member, or you can ask for a sample of our newspaper, Free Thought Today, at FFRF.org. We're very happy to have with us today as a guest, Kiathi Joshi. Kiathi Joshi is a professor of education at Fairleigh Dickinson University in New Jersey. She uh, studies the intersection of race, religion, and ethnicity, and immigration. She's written a number of books, but the most recent book of hers that we're excited to talk about today, it's called White Christian Privilege, The Illusion of Religious Equality in America. So, Professor Joshi, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Delighted to be with you, Dan and Annie Laurie. So it's a fascinating book. I really enjoyed reading the history and I enjoyed reading about the current issues. But let's talk about you just for a minute. You, um, you were raised in a Hindu family in the Bible Belt. Tell us what that was like. Yeah, um, it was tough. It was really tough on certain days and really uh, wonderful on others. Um, I, uh, as a little brown Hindu girl, didn't really quite fit in um, to my school and society in Smyrna, Mapleton, and Marietta, Georgia. Uh, I encountered a fair amount of harassment and bullying, um, so much so that there were days where I wish that I didn't have brown skin. There were days I was ashamed to be Hindu. But most weekends, I was really happy because I had a very strong Indian American community um, that really nurtured me and nourished me. So I just wish that at school I would have been accepted a little more. And I think it's really one of the reasons why I, for the last 20 years, have dev devoted my life to working with educators around social justice education, anti-racist education, making sure that all students can be their authentically themselves all the time. So in your book, you tell a story about what it's like for others, including this young man, Suha, was that his name? Uh, Suha, yes. Who, who uh, was on the sports team. Tell us, tell us about his story. Yeah, um, he was part of my uh, data collection long time ago. And his story, uh, he was in school in North Carolina. And there were two pivotal moments in his life that relate to religion and uh what happened was the first one is he was a member of the soccer team and the coach always started uh, every game in a huddle with the Lord's Prayer. And one day he decided he was no longer participating in this and he got benched. He wasn't allowed to start on the first string uh, for the rest of the season because his coach said he was um, working against team spirit. So that is Why? something. Because oh, go ahead. he didn't want to participate in the Lord's Prayer. Right. And that is something that really is unconstitutional. It shouldn't be happening in any of our public schools. So very unfortunate. And had we known about it, we would have tried to help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, Annie Laurie, that brings up a very important point for folks to know is that a lot of times um, immigrant families, immigrant communities aren't going to report such things. Uh, they don't want to make a fuss. Uh, and they don't know who to talk to. They don't want to alienate folks at the school in case there are repercussions on the, their child. 
in this particular case, actually, Suhas never told his parents. Hmm. And um, because I know that myself as an immigrant child, you know, you kind of, their work, our parents are working hard. They're trying to make ends meet. They're sending resources back home. And you just kind of learn to put up with stuff. We shouldn't have to, but that's something that happens a lot. Well, that is why public schools uh, should be nonsectarian and uh, shouldn't turn some classes into insiders and others into outsiders. And that's why we really have this history of Supreme Court law and precedent that keeps religion supposedly out of our public schools. Now, in your book, you examine Christian privilege, white privilege. Um, tell us how, how the two things connect. Well, there's been lots um, more and more being written about whiteness and whiteness in America. And I wrote this book because I saw a gap, um, a void to be filled. And that is no one was really paying attention and writing about the role that Christianity has had in the construction of whiteness. Um, imagine two cars going around a racetrack and the whiteness car and the Christian car kind of side by side. But what has happened is that because we have freedom of religion enshrined in the First Amendment, the, the, the Christian car, if you will, has kind of faded to invisible. But it's right there. And my goal in this book is to make what has been invisible visible. So, for example, um, we can go back to the Naturalization Act of 1790 um, and the subsequent amendment in 1795 that said you had to be a free white man to be of good moral character to be a citizen of this country. And then wow. later on, we see that there were discussions after African Americans gained the right to citizenship with the 14th Amendment in a subsequent Naturalization Act, um, there had been conversations saying, uh, primary source documents revealing out of California that, um, well, you know, African Americans um, have accepted Christ, and uh, so it's okay that they have citizenship, hmm. but we have to be careful of the China man and the Indian um, and, and make sure they don't get citizenship because these were folks who were not Christian. Well, maybe that's why my Native American tribe that my dad belonged to converted to Christianity in the 1830s so that we could be seen as real Americans. I bet you a lot of that went, went on, didn't it? Of course. Oh, conversion. it absolutely did. And, you know, and I want to be clear that when we are talking about people converting, you know, it is really important to not make judgment calls. We don't know what was in their heart back then. I don't know what's in someone's heart today if they convert unless they say it. So I take it at face value. But yes, there were many um, Native American groups, communities, tribes that um, converted to Christianity, but also held on to their own indigenous rituals also. So you said that now we have religious freedom in America, which we do at least on paper, religious equality. But the subtitle of your book is, is, is pretty bold. The subtitle is The Illusion of religious equality in America. So do we have religious equality or is it just an illusion? Well, it is there on paper. And the problem is I talk about it as an illusion because people think that because it's on paper, it exists in reality. And that's not the case. And so that's where the idea of illusion comes in. We have to understand that it is an ideal that we're still striving towards. Because if all religions could practice their faiths freely in an equitable manner, we wouldn't have opposition to synagogues or mosques or Hindu temples being built across this country. Um, in so many cases, in so many cities, I should say, um, the city council has put up obstacles. The townspeople can't come out to city council meetings saying, we don't want this house of worship or, you know, we don't want this mosque, we don't want this synagogue. And that just shows you right there. That's one example of how not everyone has the same level of religious freedom. So let's talk a little bit more about the inequality that is engendered by this idea that Christianity is the true religion or the United States is a Christian nation. How, how does that impact all of us who are non-Christian or all of, us, all of us who are not white? Well, I think what we have to understand is that Christianity um, is embedded 
uh, in laws and Supreme Court decisions, lower court decisions, and our societal structures today. And they have such deep roots. So, for example, um, the idea of American exceptionalism today really goes back to the idea of manifest destiny, right, where uh, those in this country, uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, believe they were ordained, ordained by God to have this land from sea to shining sea. And the roots of manifest destiny can actually be found in the doctrine of discovery, which are papal decrees in the 15 cent 1500s, 16th century, that basically said, um, if the quote-unquote explorers, who you and I would call colonizers, um, come upon land that is not inhabited by Christians, it's theirs to take. I um, wouldn't call them just colonizers. I'd call them invaders. That too. <laughs> Inva that too. An invasive species. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I think that describes it. Starting with the conquistadors, in a way, the, this manifest yes. destiny has its yeah. roots in that. Absolutely. It, it does. I mean, Christianity and colonialism go hand in hand. They both start with C. So you write about how a lot of this privilege, Christian privilege and, and white privilege is overt and we can see it, but you also write that there's a subtext that a lot of people will say, um, I, don't, I don't have privilege, I don't have, pri they have it, but they don't see it. They don't even actually know it. Tell us about that. Well, so privilege, so for, for example, if we're talking white privilege, white privilege is a product of systemic racism. If you are white in this country, you have advantages that have been bestowed upon you, whether you want them or not, because of the way laws were decided, because of the way our society has been constructed. It's got nothing to do with you personally. So sometimes, yeah, you know, I do a fair amount of public speaking and I do workshops and someone will be like, you know what? I grew up working class poor. I don't have privilege. I say, you don't have class privilege, but if you are white in America, you have white privilege. So we have to start understanding our different identities. Someone who's Jewish faces anti-Semitism. We have a history, unfortunately, a strong history of anti-Semitism um, in this country. They, are, they can be white and face anti-Semitism. So they can have white privilege and face anti-Semitism. So I think it's really about you know understanding your different identities and working from there. Uh, now, it comes across subtly sometimes because when you can't see structures and they're invisible, it's hard to see how you have advantage. But we can look at the work week and what are the days off given? Uh, Sunday is not a holy day for all religions. Indeed, not all religions even have a weekly Sabbath, right? So looking at how we talk about religion, what's considered religious? Are you considered religious because you go to a house of worship once a week? Well, as a Hindu, I don't have to go to a house of worship every week. I have a puja shrine at home where I can worship at home. So how are we thinking about religion? How do we talk about religion? All of that is done through a Christian lens in our country, and those are the things we have to start seeing. Well, isn't it a hallmark of privilege that those who have the privilege are so privileged they don't, they don't huh. even think about it? Yeah. Absolutely. They, they, they don't see, and, yeah. or, or we don't see. Yeah. So. And, and, and again, it's about, uh, uh, I've written this book uh, from a social justice perspective, and what I mean by that is that I'm really looking um, not to just tear down structures, but to look at the injustices in our history and present day so that we can build that more perfect union. And so making the invisible visible is a step in working towards justice. We have to take a break. I uh, hope you can stay with us after the break. And after the break, maybe you can tell us what we can do about this. What can any of us who care about social justice and social equality, what can we do about this? We're talking with Professor Kiati Joshi, author of the new book, White Christian Privilege. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate 
just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. I'm Doug Hinahara, and I'm an out-of-the-closet atheist. I consider myself fortunate in that I wasn't raised in an overly religious family, so I was allowed to think for myself. And around the time I was 17, as I was exploring these ideas of religion, I was told by a fundamentalist Christian that my grandmother, who had emigrated from Japan, was destined to eternal damnation because she was a Buddhist. And I couldn't accept that, and it kind of unraveled from there for me. So at this point in my life, I've been, become very comfortable with the idea that I don't need religion uh, or belief in God to be a moral person and live an ethical life. I'm proud of the fact that I have two daughters who have grown up to be wonderful young women, and I'm proud to say also atheist. Thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. You can find more content by the Freedom From Religion Foundation at our website, ffrf.org. Follow FFRF on Facebook and you'll get notifications about all of our content, including whenever we go live on FFRF's Ask an Atheist. FFRF is also on YouTube, where all of our programs, including this show and our weekly news bites, are available to watch anytime. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you on the web. Welcome back to Free Thought Matters. We're continuing our conversation with Professor Kiati Joshi, author of the new book, White Christian Privilege, The Illusion of Religious Equality in America. So Professor Joshi, uh, you, you, you're not trying to bash white Christians, are you? you? You're trying to argue for, to get rid of the word illusion, to have real religious equality in this country so we're all treated the same. And in your own life, you are involved with a variety, a diversity of religion, aren't you? Yes, yes. Um, I'm really glad you brought that up, uh, Dan. This is not a book about um, hating on Christianity or white Christians. Um, I myself am in an interfaith and interracial relationship. Um, I am married to a white Episcopalian man. Um, we've been together for over 20 years and have a teenage son. And we live our lives both, um, well, we live our lives as a Hindu Episcopalian or Episcopalian Hindu family. Um, you can find us doing, uh, living both faiths. Uh, so many a Sunday mornings, you will find me in church, well, when COVID wasn't happening. <laughs> um, and my husband will fast when I fast for the various Hindu holidays or whatever. So that's an important point. Um, it, for me, it really is about um, making our country more inclusive and more equitable for all around religion and race. So uh, you also write in your book, this isn't a, about political correctness. You no, it's not. I actually, I mean, I don't even know what political correctness is. Hmm. I just really try to work from reality um, and that means recognizing the injustices that are out there and and working for justice. And that's not easy. Um, it requires people to be okay, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, but that's really how we're going to bring about change. So, so, oh. so how can we do it? Is that what you're going to ask? Well, my question can wait. <laughs> so, so, um, so how can we do that? How can we make a difference? Uh, so in the last chapter of the book, um, I talk about making change, and here I provide the readers, or if you're listening to the audio book, uh, the listeners, um, a, a, a mini blueprint on how to rethink certain ideas in our country and then to take action. So I talk about um, changing the language, changing the focus, changing the questions, for example, you know, the, I've been asked countless times, what's my Bible or what's mm -hmm. my Christmas? Um, well, in my case, in Hinduism, we have many different sacred scriptures, not just one. You know, um, instead, can we ask, oh, well, what's your sacred scripture? Or what are the most significant holidays for you, right? Taking that Christian normativity out of it. Um, we need to change the foundational assumption that we're all the same, we are not the same. We do not pray the same way. We don't pray in the same structures. Um, some 
place, uh, some religions don't really even have written tradition, more oral tradition, right? So there's this sense, like especially in interfaith work, about looking at how we're all the same. And that, I think, has been a fundamental flaw. We also have to look at how we're different. Well, even the, Christians don't pray the same way or worship or preach the same way. They're all disagreeing yes. with each other in their denominations. Well, and you know, the original <laughs> motto of the United States is e pluribus unum, from many come one, which really celebrates unity through diversity, that we can all believe in the same government, this, uh, work, be the same citizens, but we don't have to be the same. That's right, we don't. And so to value, you know, what uh, the perspectives that different people bring, I mean, why is it that the moral questions of today, um, you know, often center around issues of life and abortion and pro-choice um, and not environmental justice? Because the conservative segment of Christian America has made that the moral question. We have to reframe our moral questions. You know, and that's where we can see again the influence of Christianity. And you also talk about getting, I think, what is it, getting proximate? Can you explain yes. that? Yes, actually, that comes from Brian Stevenson's work. Um, he was the uh, attorney, African American attorney, who founded the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. And he talks about the need to get proximate, which means we can't make change in our country. Um, just by reading or watching your show or listening to podcasts, we're going to need to kind of uh, get down and dirty, if you will. We got to get to know people who are different than us. We have to get close to the social problems that exist in order to solve them. We cannot solve them from afar. Do you think it's possible in the schools that we can talk about religion equitably without privileging one group over another? We can, but it's going to take work and it's going to take um, school leaders saying we want to do this. Um, there's so much fear about bringing in religion. I often, when I go into schools, you know, a superintendent or a building principal will say to me, oh, Dr. Joshi, we, you know, we don't really, we, we don't talk about religion in the school. Religion is not here. And I'm like, Christianity's here, folks. Are you going to bring the other religions in? Are we going to be respectful of our students who are humanists and come from atheist and agnostic families? Because to say, to think we are at religion neutral is a farce. To think we are at race neutral is a farce. We live, and this can be difficult to hear, we live in a society that, uh, where the starting point is white Christian supremacist culture. And of course, uh, having education about religion is great, having information, but what we don't want in our schools are devotions. Absolutely. The expectation of worship or that you have to be one religion or another, because that has been just poison. That has caused well, so much problems for minority children. And a lot of teachers can't, can't resist proselytizing. They bring their religion with them. It's very hard for them to be objective and fair to all points of view, isn't it? Well, I would say that um, I think that is true for some. I think for some, it also needs to be part of their training, right? I mean, teachers don't leave who they are at the door. And I know many teachers who are devout Christians who would never want to um, make any of their students feel uncomfortable. But they don't know how necessarily, because it's not been part of their training, to bring it in in a way that is educational and not about preaching about the religion. Uh, in 2018, the National Geographic made an announcement, sort of an apology, our coverage has been racist. And that was good, but you said that kind of missed the mark. And just very briefly, why? Well, um, as somebody who suffered because of the stereotypes in National Geographic magazines about India and Indian culture um, and religion in general, um, I was thrilled to see that apology because I was, I was humiliated time after time because of the depictions mm -hmm. of India. Um, at the same time, their depictions were not just about race and culture, and, but they were also depicting religions as backwards and these indigenous people and look at their kind of, they didn't use the word heathen at times, but they were really, you know, look at how uncivilized they are. So really the apology should have been around religion and culture and ethnicity and not just about race and ethnicity. 
So we are a nation of immigrants, so obviously, for most of us, of course my ancestors were here for 15,000 years, but we are a nation of immigrants. They even came from somewhere else, so we all come from somewhere else. And um, you hear this chant a lot of times by the right wing, uh, uh, united we stand, united we stand. Isn't a better motto, divided we stand? Wouldn't that be a nicer thing to say? We don't all have to think the same. Well, I'm not sure if divided we stand, but I do agree with the sentiment that you're trying to relay. And also, I'd like for us to get away from the tagline um, that we're a land of immigrants. Um, it does erase what happened to Native Americans. It erases uh, the folks who were enslaved and brought over. And let's be clear, there were many a decades where Lady Liberty's torch should have been put behind her back because we were not welcoming immigrants. Indeed, we did not want them. So um, I would con I consider that you know uh, phrase "We are a land of immigrants" like part of a marketing tagline that's really worked, and we need to stop using it. Well, we, we only have about a minute left. Um, how about a, any parting observations for our viewers? Um, it's a great moment right now. I wish that so many um, black men and women didn't have to die for us to see the change we need to make, specifically uh, the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. Um, at the same time, we we are seeing, I think we're absolutely living in a, an amazing moment. Uh, I feel very energized and we have to take in information, learn new history, well, learn more accurate United States history and then take action in our communities to build a more just society. Well, thank you. Your book is fascinating, Professor Joshi. Kiati, did I say it right? Kiati? You did. Kiati, yeah. Kiati Joshi. The book is white. Christian Privilege, the Illusion of Religious Equality in America. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.